Hello! Welcome to Center Saint Sister. This is a space where spirited, hurting, searching, faithful people come together and ask hard questions and listen to some really wise people share about how they have lived life deeply. If this episode spoke to you, I hope that you leave a review and subscribe. You can visit YouTube slash Allison Sullivan for some really fun extras. I hope you hear something today that lets you know you are loved and helps you love one another. Welcome to Center Saint Sister. Many years ago now, Seth and I were debating a potential call to adoption. We definitely felt led there, but we were a little uncertain and we were a lot scared. The application was filled out, but pressing that send button was something we couldn't yet do. So we committed to a week of prayer. The next morning, I woke up and went for a run, and I don't mean to make that sound easy or swift because I do not easily or swiftly go for a run. But baby weight wasn't coming off with diet alone, so I committed to it, even though it was really hard for me. And I hated it. I mean, I really hated it. And the only way that I could talk myself onto that treadmill was if I told myself, if I think I'm going to die, then I'm allowed to quit after two minutes. I can do anything for two minutes. And so I just took it two minutes at a time. Just like that. Two minutes at a time. And then, before I knew it, not really. A lifetime later, 30 minutes had gone by and I felt stronger already. I look back on that season with so much fondness. Everyone knows that the last two minutes of a race are the hardest. It's always when you can see the finish line that a race really tests your endurance. So for those last two minutes of my run, I would employ really desperate strat- strategies, very melodramatic strategies. And they're embarrassing to put into the interweb, but this is a story that was important for our family. So. Here's how this would go. The last two minutes of my runs, I would pretend that I was in a race that for some reason secured the life of my children if I finished it strongly. I know. And that worked for a while. Kept me moving and all. But then when it quit working, I know, (laughs) and I wanted to keel over, I was almost content to let the kids keel over with me. I would up the ante and I would picture them cheering for me instead. And I would go through each member of our family individually, and I would picture them yelling wildly for their mama to just keep going. I picture Silas jumping up and down, all angles and elbows, yelling like a madman. I picture Millie smiling ear to ear, stifling a squeal, clasping her hands and squatting in excitement. I picture Blaze, wide-eyed and unsure, looking to Silas for exactly what it is he's supposed to feel. And I picture Wren with Manny, perched on her hip, him looking into her face, her explaining the excitement. And then I would picture Seth celebrating wildly, even though it's not necessarily in his nature to do so. But because it was me and because he knows what's hard for me, all bets were off. And he would be pumping his fists and hooting and hollering with all kinds of abandon. And that would work for about 20 more seconds. So when it was time to up the ante again, I would move to Jesus. And I would think of he and I carrying that cross together. We were tired and beat. And we couldn't, we couldn't do it anymore. And we would be just about to see God. So we would just promise each other that just one more step, we would talk to each other and encourage and console because that's what friends do. And then when I would run out of things for us to say to one another, I would think about what meeting God was going to be like. I would go through a list of verbs, all that I would do when we finally came face to face. What would I do? And I pictured that metaphorical and literal finish line, God greeting Jesus and I. Jesus and I swinging each other around because we did it. We actually did it. Him for me and then me for him together. God usually wouldn't say too much. But how he felt about me, how he felt about my race, it was right there in the quiet hug. And then after all of that, I would have about 30 seconds left of my run. And so I would just huff and puff and count every last one. I know. It's all so contrived but let the necessary melodrama speak for what a poor, poor runner I was. I haven't been running much lately, but when Jason Johnson, today's guest, described his own spiritual journey as a strenuous, rewarding run, this memory came rushing back to me. It didn't feel polite to start jumping up and down mid-interview and shrieking, oh my gosh, me too, but truly, me too. Like I said, I haven't been running lately, and I can't help but notice how comfortable it all is. We're so comfortable. And I'm just not sure I want to comfortably cross a finish line with Jesus. I think I'd rather be spent for him. 
I'd rather risk and sprint and sweat and then really celebrate knowing that I gave and offered everything, that nothing was off limits. The Beatitudes, they weren't given as a salve to a certain group of people who happened to be in a bad spot. The Beatitudes were given to everyone as a reminder of what the Lord holds dear. Blessed are those who mourn. And yet we spend our whole lives trying to avoid pain. I ran for the first time a week ago, right after this interview, and these thoughts swirled among panting and heaves and counted seconds. And there was something about being in pain that made me just cut to the chase. And it really came down to just one question. Do I believe God is real or not? And if I do believe, then I have this one life, one, to do all I can to please him. One, life isn't about my comfort here. It's about my comfort there. And I want to cross my finish line knowing that I did everything I could to love well. Today, Jason talks to us about foster care, the beauty it contains, the fear that prevents it, the gospel it proclaims. I'm praying for all of us as we listen. During my run, I kept repeating the meditative phrase as prayer, nothing is off limits. Not our money, not our comfort, not even our happy family. And while that is scary, I just need to take what I believe he's telling me two minutes at a time, just two minutes at a time. I feel stronger already. Like I said, I'm praying for us. Two words, junk gypsy. Do you know these creative misfits? If you do, congratulations. If you don't, you can thank me later. You are about to be so delighted and inspired. Junk Gypsy is my favorite home away from home with two of my favorite glitzy sisters who have a knack for creating spaces that all caps thrill me. They have a store. It's so fun. It's eclectic. It's filled with vintage and new curated finds. It's nestled in this most adorable little town, Round Top, Texas population, like 90 or something. Um, I've been to the Wander Inn. They have a bed and breakfast that is delightful. It restores my peace every single time I go. Go visit them at gypsyville.com. You will not be disappointed. Hurry. Jason, I'm so excited that you are here. You are a pastor, you're a teacher, you're a speaker, a writer, a director, a coach, a consultant, an encourager, an activist, an advocate, an optimist, a local hero, and a national treasure. And it is such an honor to have someone as committed as you on the show. Thank you so much for being here today to talk about foster care. We're excited to have you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Um, it's funny because I'm an adoptive mom and my best friend's family fosters, and we both started the journey about at the same time, and it, they were very uncharted waters. And either she sent me something of yours or I sent her something, I don't really remember, but together we found your wisdom. And I'm telling you that it was probably a year later before I realized that we were neighbors. <laughs> at first, you were just this knowledgeable, inspiring sage, but then you were this neighborly, knowledgeable, inspiring sage. And I felt so lucky because I knew that one of these days our paths were going to cross. And I'm so lucky. I feel so lucky that our town has you. Um, if you could please introduce yourself to the listeners um, by telling us a little bit about who and what you love, how you got started in foster care and what you're doing now. Yeah, well, um, it is wild. It's wild that our our two little towns here in the middle of Texas um, have have what it has. It's it's so funny. Um, I think you and I have a lot of mutual yes. friends, acquaintances. We've probably been in some of the same rooms together unknowingly, <laughs> but our journey here began. Um, I came down here for school and met my wife our senior year. Uh, we've been married 20 years now. Uh, we've got four girls, um, uh, 16, 14, 12, 10, mm -hmm. uh, our oldest three are biological. We began fostering when we were in Houston. Uh, we, we went from here down to Houston. We've been involved in ministry my whole, uh, my whole life, frankly, grew up mm -hmm. in a pastor's home and, mm -hmm. uh, that's all that I've ever really done. And we became foster parents in Houston in 2012. And our youngest daughter uh, came to us as a placement and, um, actually, uh, kind of the mixed tension of, unfortunately, she never was able to go home. Uh, her family was never in a position where they were able to really receive her back. But then fortunately she's 
become our daughter. And so we live in this, we have lived in this tension for quite a long time of, yeah. we celebrate the fact that she is our 10 year old daughter, but we mourn the fact that any of this even ever had to happen in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and that it's a part of her story. And then we've had some other, uh, other little girls come and go. And then our journey evolved into actually opening our home to young moms. Uh, and that began uh, after we had moved back here mm -hmm. from Houston, uh, actually through some mutual friends of ours who had become aware of a situation where there was a mom and a couple of little baby, twin baby, newborn girls. And um, we had the opportunity to step into that and then mm -hmm. uh, had the opportunity shortly after that to open our home through foster care to a young mom. And they've been a part of our, our story uh, now for the last five years. And so that's mm. the quick, 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 quick version of what our family looks like. People often ask, how many kids do you have? And the answer is, <laughs> well, it's complicated. How much time do you have? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and so in a nutshell, we've got our, our four girls that live with us. So we've got our bonus daughter, who's now 22. Mm. She's got mm. three little ones. Uh, and our grandparent names are JJ and Emmy. Wonderful. That's yeah. really, really beautiful. How about professionally? What are you doing professionally these days? Yeah. So um, uh, in Houston and was involved in, in uh, ministry and then that evolved into church planting. And so was involved in church planting in Houston. And that's where we became foster parents. Our church got very involved in that. And I began to help work with a lot of churches in Houston, mm -hmm. which then evolved into just working with churches anywhere and everywhere. And so now I get to work for an organization uh, that um, it's a national organization. And I spend my time working with church leadership and organizational leadership, nonprofit leadership mm -hmm. uh, on just best practices of engagement, um, strategy, resource development. And so on one side, I get to work with a lot of leaders around the country. And then on another side, I get to spend a lot of time in rooms, conferences, workshops, different environments, just encouraging. Yeah families that have opened their homes to kiddos. Yeah. And um, that's a lot of fun uh, to be in those rooms. Yeah. Uh, and, and then in the summers, I get to lay low a little bit. And so we get to live here, don't work here. I travel a lot. Uh, yeah. And I just get to spend a lot of time in really great rooms with really incredible people doing really incredible work. Thank you. Your expertise is really appreciated. I've felt personally encouraged by you many mm -hmm. times. Um, so it's hard to talk about foster care without also talking about addiction and poverty and abuse. Right. And there's something about my makeup that wants to back up. You know, um, yeah. it's like we have these societal problems that lead to these precarious households and then end up preventing what would be the most um, ideal situations for families and for children. But for many children, as we know, um, their families are, are currently failing them and the system is currently failing them. And there's still a current crisis to manage right here, right now. And that's that there simply aren't enough homes to take in kids who need one. Um, can you give us some updated statistics, Jason? Can you start off speaking to just the need for foster homes? Yeah, you know, the statistics vary from community to community, and, sure. and those statistics will, would be available, you, you know, if you were to look at local organizations or DHS or CPS offices, but uh, while those may vary universally, what's true is that there's generally just this this understood reality that there's not enough. And that's kind of the language that defines the foster care system. Yeah. Um, and that's not um, an indictment on so many good people and so many good organizations doing so much good work. It's just, it's like a flood. And yeah. um, when all you've got is buckets, people with buckets doing good, noble work of trying to yeah. kind of get as much water out as possible, it's it's really just a matter of capacity, yeah. not... Um, uh, not capability, you know, these are good right. people doing good work. It's just too much. And so, so not enough families, uh, available, opening their homes for kids that need them. And so in a lot of communities, you have kids, uh, sleeping in, in caseworkers offices and government buildings and hotels and mm -hmm. group homes. And, uh, so we say there's not enough families, not enough support for those families that are opening their homes, not enough support for biological families that are trying mm -hmm. real hard to stay yes. together or yes. trying real hard to get back together. Yeah. And then one of the forgotten, uh, a couple of forgotten pieces in, in this ecosystem uh, that surrounds these kids' stories. You know, generally when we think of foster care, we think, oh, we open our home to a child. Well, yes, 
but there's an entire ecosystem that comes with that child. And that includes their biological family. It includes mm -hmm. the, some generational cycles that likely mm -hmm. led them there. It includes the community they come from. Uh, it also includes other key players in that story, uh, which um, will include people like child welfare professionals, caseworkers, mm -hmm. you know, not enough support for them. The, yeah. the average lifespan of a, of a social worker is about 12 months. It's a hard, hard job. Jeez. And they don't get paid enough if they just go, right. that's, it's just too much. And uh, another uh, piece in this is kinship, what's referred to as kinship, not enough support for kinship placements. That means uh, maybe it's grandma raising grandkids yeah. or yeah. auntie raising uh, nep niece and nephew or cousins raising cousins. And generally, they didn't ask for this. You know, the difference here is foster parents kind of sign up for this. They go to classes. They, they're like intentionally moving towards this. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, grandma gets a call that says, hey, uh, here's what's happened. And it, are you willing to take them? If not, we got to find a place for them to go. Like she didn't ask for that. But of course, she's going to say, yeah, like, uh, why would I not bring them in? Right. And how do we wrap around and support them? And so yeah. these are this is kind of the larger ecosystem that we're dealing with when we talk about foster care. And what we what we believe is that while it's defined by not enough right now, I actually believe there's more than enough of all of these things out there available already in the faith community and not even not necessarily in the faith community, just in general, in, in humanity, I believe there's, there's more than enough families, there's more than enough support, there's more than enough resources. We just kind of have to collectively come together and say, we're going to put what we got on the table and we're going to make this happen. Right. Yeah. So while that sounds largely overwhelming, yeah. um, one of the things that I, I love about you most is that you make impossible seem impossible things seem pretty manageable. Um, and so th when you think about the, the overwhelm, um, what are some things that we can do right here, right now? Because yeah. you do, you hear these numbers that seem, I mean, I think I read something that it's like the number of kids in foster care is l larger than the number of kids in Chicago's public school system. Mm -hmm. So you hear that and you're like, well, what in the world am I going to do about that? What are some, right. what are yeah. some very tangible things to, it's good. to do now? Yeah. So, you know, there are roughly 400,000 plus kids in the, in the foster care system right now, roughly a hundred thousand uh, that are waiting to be adopted, meaning parental rights have been terminated and they need forever homes. Like these are the big overwhelming numbers and you're right. People, you know, research shows and just human experience shows that when people are confronted with large sets of data that they don't understand, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they kind of discard them. Um, mm -hmm. it's, you, it's, it's easy to dehumanize large sets of data on a spreadsheet. Yes. Um, yes. and so what we're what we work hard on with organizations and churches and local agencies and just local stakeholders and community partners is really saying yeah here's the large reality now let's set that aside and yeah. let's shrink it let's shrink it down to what's manageable accomplishable and what you can relate to on a human level and so we talk a lot about proximity we want to increase proximity when i'm when yes. i'm confronted with large things that i don't understand that feels really far away. Yeah. And I'm going to fill that gap between me and it with a lot of excuses. For, yes. Honestly, I'm going to fill it with a lot of um, misconceptions. I'm going to mm -hmm. fill it with a lot of bias. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is, is increase proximity and bring things a little bit closer. And suddenly you begin to see it for what it is. And you go, whoa, my biases were way off. My assumptions yeah. were way off uh, this and that. And the closer that we bring something to someone, the the more difficult it is for them to pretend like it doesn't exist. Oh right. no, I've seen it, and I can't pretend yes. like I can never unsee it. So that means um, a couple of things. It means re it means um, what we talk about often is shrinking the problem, not minimizing the problem, not negating the problem, just taking the problem and making it uh, helping people relate to it on a human level. And so. Uh, that could mean, all right, I can't solve all the problems and it feels overwhelming, but here's what I want to do. I want to find a, a family that I know in my sphere that may be caring for kiddos 
that aren't biologically theirs. And I say it that way because um, that could mean foster family. It could mean adoptive family that's, that's really underwater. It could also mean kinship family. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, it could mean grandma taking care of, of kid. We, my wife and I were walking in our neighborhood, uh, last week, we take a walk every evening, ran into some neighbors that we've known, we we've known them for a long time. Uh, and they were, they were saying, oh, it feels so good to, uh, to get out of the house. I don't know if you've known, if you know this, but we have a 17 year old nephew living with us and we're really struggling. It's really hard. And wow. again, we stopped and we talked for a while, but it struck yeah. me, my gosh, there's more of this happening kind of under the the surface than I think we're aware of because most yeah. people that are opening their homes don't walk around with a sign on their forehead that says, Hey, everybody, sure. look at us, look at what right. we're doing. Right. So let's find these families and let's, let's serve them. Let's support them. Let's yeah. say to them, let's not say to them, Hey, let me know if, let me know if I can ever do anything for you. Well, that's not going to happen. They're not going to ever yeah. let you know. Let's like get in front of them and pull out our calendars and say, well, hey, we want you guys to go out on a date uh, or, hey, we want to bring a meal to you guys. How does next Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday look kind That's of thing, right. right? Like, let's let's get it. And what that does is for some people, they might say, well, that doesn't feel very significant, like bringing a meal to someone or babysitting or helping that feels small. Uh, and we go, oh, no, no, there's nothing small about getting a little bit closer to this. That's yeah. significant. And it's yeah. significant to those that you're serving. It's significant to the one that's doing the serving. So we talk a lot about let's look at what's going on in our own backyards. Yes. Um, let's identify what problems can we solve that are actionable, that are accomplishable. Uh, and let's remove all of this, per, this language or this misconception that says, if I'm not doing something big, if I'm not like, you know, bringing all these kids into my home and buying a 15 passenger van and, you know, then I'm not doing anything significant. No, no, no. That's right. There are no insignificant parts in this. Uh, every, every act of moving a little bit closer to this is, um, heavy with significance on both sides for those that mm -hmm. you're serving and for those that are doing the serving. Mm -hmm. Dorothy yeah. Day, a spiritual mentor of mine says that everybody wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know, That's it. um, yeah. you know, you posted something yesterday and perhaps you can recall it better than I can because it's yours. But, um, there was a really surprising statistic about if every church did this one right, thing, right. do you mind yeah. repeating that? Yeah. So there's some pithy statements that, um, that are out there that simply, they sound good, but they're not true. And, uh, yeah. you know, one of those is, um, you know, if every, if every, here's the simple math, if every church fostered one child, we could effectively, um, end the foster care crisis and it sounds good. And I understand the sentiment, but the reality is, is that if every church today fostered every child that was in the system today, it would empty the system today, but we would all wake up tomorrow yeah. with a whole new set of kids in the system right. uh, because there's a faucet that's on yes. and it's on full blast yes. and it needs to be turned off. And so an illustration that we use often is this idea of kind of this river. And let's say that three guys walk up to a river and they see children and families flowing down the river. The first guy jumps in midstream because there's people right in front of him and who, who would stand there and let people float by, right? Like it's yeah. just, that's just the right thing to do. Uh, and so he jumps in midstream and we would say that's where foster care sits. Something has happened and kids and families are now in the water. Uh, or they're midstream and there's a crisis and we need, and that's where we'd say, we need more foster homes. We need more support for biological families working hard to get their kiddos back. Uh, something has happened. The second guy runs downstream because he knows that there's a, 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 a cliff at the end of the river. It's a waterfall. Mm -hmm. And the further downstream these, these people make it, the worse it's going to be. And we would call that maybe uh, you know, like restoration, like, uh, statistically things like trafficking, homelessness, incarceration, teen pregnancy, poverty, statistically, there's a strong tie to those downstream issues and the upstream issue of family and child welfare. Um, the vast majority of men living on the streets, homeless, uh, their story is I was once in foster care. I was once yeah. in the system kind of thing. Same is true in incarceration. Uh, mm. In many parts of the country, uh, the 
the place that that human traffickers are going to um, to pick people out is they're looking for people that uh, they're looking for young adults, for kiddos that have no support systems, no families that are struggling, that are far down the stream kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we need to address those issues. And a lot of commu- churches and faith communities and, and social services are doing that. You might come across a church that says we're, we're serving the homeless community in our city and we're working with anti-trafficking. We'd say, great. The third guy runs upstream because his question is, how are these people making it, getting in the water in the first place? And is there anything that I can do to stop it? And that's what we would call prevention. Yeah. And that's asking the question, what um, cyclical um, issues, what social issues are, are contributing to the dissolvement of families mm-hmm. that, and are contributing to more people finding themselves in midstream? And can we, can we stop problems from becoming problems before they ever become, you know, the big problems they are. And these are things like poverty and abuse and addiction and things like this. But the stream itself looks um, linear, but in fact, it's just this big, vicious, horrible, uh, cyclical, lazy river kind of thing Mm -hmm. uh, that goes around and around because the downstream issues of poverty and homelessness and incarceration and, and drug abuse and teen pregnancy uh, end up becoming upstream issues that become contributors to midstream issues. So when we talk about let's end the foster care crisis, generally speaking, people think, well, if we can just get every church to foster a kid midstream, it'll, it'll end the crisis. And we go, well, no, because uh, the stream is much larger than just what's happening midstream. Uh, and so we'd say all three of these guys are jumping into the river for the same purpose, to, to get and keep people out of the water. But what where they're engaging looks very different, um, but it's all interconnected. And then to your point, um, everybody wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. You know, I think everybody wants... Everybody wants to make a difference, but nobody wants to get in the water. Yeah. Uh, we like the idea of, I, hey, can I just stand on the shore and like reach out and and grab people, but not get wet because I don't really want to get uncomfortable. And we don't actually know the solution here is um, we need people willing to get down in the water with kids and yeah. families and say, hey, um, I'm with you in this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to walk with you in this. And this is where I'm, I'm, when I think of kind of the story of God and the person of Jesus, what I see and what we celebrate at Christmas, it's July right now when we're recording this Christmas in July. Uh, what God did is not say, Hey, I see you. And that looks rough. Um, if you could climb yourself out of that, then we, you know, let's, then we can be together. What I see in, in the incarnation is God saying, uh, I see you in the river and I'm actually, I'm going to get in the river with you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to walk with you in this thing. Uh, and that's, I think that's where people kind of go, oh man, I, I really want to make a change, but I don't know if I'm capable of doing that. Yeah. yeah. It's like we're formed enough to say that the cross saves the whole world, but we don't want anything to do with it. We all want change, but we're too afraid to die to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like there's there's extra special um, spiritual superheroes out there that'll do that. And like, I'm all for supporting them, but I'm not really interested in getting wet. And, and we go, well, um, then we've, well, then we probably have less of a foster care crisis and more of a discipleship crisis. Wow, that's um, powerful. That w- what are we actually doing if we're not shifting narratives in people in our churches away from the narrative of the world, which subtly and oftentimes overtly tells us the goal of your life is comfort and convenience to live and comfortable, to live free. comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And if you ever come across anything that's, that's potentially compromising to that hard or difficult or uncomfortable, isolate from it, insulate from it, run as far away from it as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And this new narrative of the gospel says, actually, what would it look like if we moved towards hard and broken places and struggling people as a reflection of what we believe about what God has done for us for through us. For, through Jesus. 
Um, and how can we raise our hands and worship to a God that has moved towards us and our heart and broken, and then use those same hands to push the heart and broken of other people away? We can't. And so we've got a discipleship issue and I get it. I get, I, I want to be realistic and, and not say throw caution to the wind, just kind of, you know, run full force towards hard and broken things. Like we want to prepare people and we want them to have realistic expectations and I've sat in that seat of a church leader that says, that thinks, man, but I want my church to be a safe and comfortable place for people to come. Uh, sure. I want them to have, you know, I want them to have good coffee and their mm -hmm. kids to be safe here and us, mm -hmm. you know. And so a vision that we often cast for especially churches that we work with is what would it look like if, if your church became a safe place mm -hmm. for people to do some really hard things? Mm. And I think that's what we all want. I want yeah. this to be a safe place. We're not saying throw caution to the wind and go full force unprepared and crash and burn. No, Yeah. we want this to be a safe place where we can go out and we can get into the river with people um, and we can do some hard things together. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, the control and certainty are, are myths. And the thing about fear or concern is that it's, it's logical and it really mm -hmm. does protect us. Our fear does protect us from things. Yeah. So it's not always necessarily a bad thing, but it is 100% bad theology to think that just because we love God that, and, and want to, to do good, that bad things won't um, happen to us. It's yeah, uh, the bad I, thing won't happen to us because we have faith. The truth is, is that the bad thing might happen. It's just that because of our faith, we won't be crushed by it. Um, that's right. the that's trust right. can't be in, in pain-free living. It has to be in a God who takes care of us, no matter our circumstances. Yeah. Who brings purpose to that pain and it, right. meaning to it. It's where we are able to say, gosh, this is really, really, really hard and uncomfortable, but 100% absolutely worth it. So we are all grownups and we probably have some sort of idea of what foster care is in our own minds. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's a horror story or maybe it's some story that's a beautiful victory or maybe it's a story that made us feel some urgency um, to step in. But we have these ideas mm -hmm. and maybe it's firsthand knowledge, but maybe it's from supporting a family or a friend or maybe it's from something, you know, in the media or whatever. Um, but my point is that we off we often make decisions off of what those ideas might be. And so it's really kind of a lot of times how well we can imagine something. And the problem with that is that it's never really quite accurate. <laughs> right. So I was just I, I'm wondering if mm -hmm. you can talk us through. foster care is full of unknowns and surprises. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if we could address some of the common barriers and then yeah. how realistic those might even be. Fantastic question. Um, so there's a lot of confirmation bias that happens. Confirmation bias meaning um, here's my own particular worldview and experiences and biases. And then I'm just going to kind of gather different pieces of information out there that confirm what I think. Uh -huh. uh, and um, going back to your point on fear, fear is, is the primary, it, it's the root of so many of these barriers. Um, mm -hmm. And and you're right, fear protects us, but fear can also paralyze us. And, yeah. and, and that's kind of the fight or flight um, mm -hmm. thing. And, and here's the relationship. I think a lot of us, we have really unhealthy relationships with fear. And here's kind of how we express it in a lot of different rooms I get to be in around the country is, um, let's say uh, the number one fear that people will often express when it comes to why they don't feel like they can get involved in foster care is this, I'm afraid of getting too attached. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of attaching to a child that I'm going to have to let go of. Um, and there's all kinds of responses to that. Um, and, and I get it. And so we want to say, Hey, that's totally get it. Totally understand. Uh, what I'm convinced of is we have, we have, uh, unhealthy relationships with our fear. We also have people around us that are afraid to, conf to confront our biases. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of pacify each other and we say, oh yeah, I understand. When, what if we actually had people around us that say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but I think you're thinking about it totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I often say we've got these fruits of fear 
um, things that we say out loud. I'm afraid of getting too attached or I'm afraid of the effect it's going to have on my biological kids or kids already are in my home, or I'm afraid that it might not turn out the way that I want it to. That's control. Or I'm afraid of this or I'm afraid of that. And we go, Hey, I, I hear what you're saying. Those are real. Those are real legit things. Now that's that. What if that's the fruit of the fear, but the root of the fear is something entirely different. The, the root I'm, I believe of, I'm afraid of getting too attached is, is, uh, grief. It's I, I actually, I'm afraid I don't have what it takes to grieve through hard things. Yeah. And so suddenly we begin to see a lot of times the things that we, pro, that we think are barriers, we're, we're kind of projecting onto external scapegoats. I know I'm getting, you're like, what is he talking about? Trust me. Yeah. Is, yeah. is we're going, I'm afraid of those out, those things out there. I'm afraid of, of attachment and I'm afraid of kids. Well, actually, what if what you're really afraid of is in is internal? I'm afraid I don't have what it takes to grieve through hard goodbyes, yeah. or I'm afraid wow. of the effect it might have on kids in my home. We go, Hey, that's good. I'm glad that you're thinking through that. I'd actually be more concerned if you weren't. Mm -hmm. um, but now let's go underneath that. And what if the root of that fear is, you know, I'm not afraid of the effect it's going to have on my kids out there externally. Really, I'm afraid that I don't have what it takes to parent my kids through hard things because yeah. every Christian book I've ever read on parenting says shelter them. Uh, and now I'm doing the opposite, you know, and I'm afraid I don't have what it takes. Or what if I'm, it's not that I'm afraid that it might not turn out the way I want it to, external circumstances. Really, I'm afraid internally that I don't have what it takes to, to let go of my need for control like that. Yeah. So we've got the fruit of the fears that we project. And then I think we've got root fears that are more internal. And that's where the work needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's where I say... Um, that's where discipleship happens. That's where authenticity and community happens, where we're able to say to each other, hey, man, I hear what you're saying and I love you, but I think you're thinking about it totally wrong. Yeah. Um, and um, there's a revolution right there, just in, in surrounding we ourselves. Yeah. Being able yeah. to say that to one another. Yeah. Yeah. And then not coming across as like aggressive or condescending, but loving, yeah. like loving. I would want, I'd want someone to say, hey, Jason, man, I, I hear what you're saying, and I totally resonate with with what you're thinking. But um, what if we what if we looked at it from a completely different angle and explored whether or not there was some truth there? Absolutely, what a gift! Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, you do hear all the time. Oh, I, I could never do that. I'd get too attached and. I, this is a far less deep response than what you just gave. But for me, um, it it seems to imply that the person doing the work doesn't get attached. Of course they do. They've just placed the child's needs above their own. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's such a low, it, and I, I try to give grace to people who um, don't know what they don't know and they're doing their yeah. best to put words to something. So we have a, an article out there called five things to know about the fear of getting too attached where we just kind of dispel, we say like, number one, it, it's kind of an, it's kind of a warped understanding of what the goal is. The goal it first and foremost is reunification with healthy, stable, loving biological family. Uh, and the, so the goal of foster care is not to get a child for our family. The goal is to give our family for a child mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. the implications mm -hmm. and the ecosystem that comes with that. Um, and so I understand if your goal is to get a child, mm -hmm. then you're going to be terrified mm -hmm. of not getting what you want. Yeah. And that fear of getting too attached is going to paralyze you. Right. Um, now, obviously, almost half of the time, uh, foster care, uh, the result is that, unfortunately, kids aren't able to go home and they need safe, permanent, alternative placement, adoption, or with family or non-family. And that's true. But our objective and our posture is to give and to, and, to, and to get ourselves to a point where we're able to say the hard is going to be hard immensely hard and the yeah. grief is going to be deep and real, yeah. but it's going to be bathed in and clothed in this purpose and this meaning that doesn't make it in vain or doesn't yeah. make it uh, pointless. There's going yes. to be purpose behind the pain that I'm willingly yes. choosing to step into. It's so good. Um, yeah. And that's an entirely different posture than just, sure. here's what I want to get out of this. Yeah. And if I don't get what I want out of this, then I'm, I'm done. I'm out. 
Right. Okay. So speaking yeah. of posture, um, my, my best friend who is just thick in the middle of giving her family has the most mm. humble posture. And she has recognized, um, as we all should, that family is society's most basic form of cohesion, you know, mm. and, um, she has just chosen to fight for that. And there have been times or of course, where reunification with family isn't what's safe or best. Yeah. Um, but my point is that she has befriended and supported and maintained relationship, um, with every single family that she has stepped in mm. for. Um, she has communicated with so much love and respect that there's, there's just enough trust built in the process, regardless of the circumstance. Um, there's a kinship. She, she has kind of kids all over, but, um, sometimes the parents are able to eventually parent. They just needed some time and, and rehabilitation. And sometimes the child is placed elsewhere for adoption or with a family member, but in every single scenario, she's been able to continue loving that child that was once in her care in some form or fashion. And, um, humility was such a huge component of that success and for in me looking outside in. Um, so how, so let's, can we talk about that humility for a moment instead of expertise? Um, and that being so, you know, fundamental in the process, it, I think it's a likely, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge to come in so willing to parent with maybe some, du all your ducks in a row. Um, what are your thoughts about not just loving their, this child, but also loving their family? as yeah. challenging as that might be in some cases. It certainly is challenging. And um, uh, I'll never forget um, our very first placement. Um, there was just enough time between um, the night that uh, she was brought to us and the first time that we met biological mom, just enough time for me to really build up in my mind um, a perception of mom that was vilifying and and kind of dehumanizing and demonizing uh what kind of evil not even person could do something like this to a child uh and so i went into this first meeting with with this perception and then we sat across the table from her and i heard her story and suddenly we realized this isn't some evil demon this is a real life human with a, a real hard story that genuinely legitimately loves her baby girl and genuinely legitimately has demons in her life that she can't get out from underneath. Mm -hmm. And in my uh, kind of middle, upper middle class, white suburban cerebral mind, the logic was, um, no, those two things can't coexist. Either you love your kids and you stop doing drugs or, or you, you, you can't right. love both. And what right. I, what I learned in that moment is, oh yes, you can. Yeah. And it completely blew paradigms and completely just shattered, you know, <laughs> everything that I thought I knew about how the world worked and how people work. And, and, and I say that to say, um, that's what it's going to take for a lot of people is yeah. these, these paradigm shattering encounters with real life human yes. beings. And that's the proximity, yes. right? The yes. further away I was from that mom, the more I could fill that space sitting across the table from her face to face. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. space to fill. Like yeah. here it is right here. Um, and so 100%. And, and I get that, for, especially for those that are getting into it for the first time, um, you don't know what you don't know. And you haven't experienced what you haven't experienced. Yeah. So our encouragement is, is as opportunities are made available to you to increase that proximity and to connect on a human level, this is why we do what we do, to engage in the whole ecosystem that revolves around this kiddo. Uh, and um, every case is different. Some require that there is separation for safety reasons. Some some. Uh, just by nature of the, the situation, maybe they're incarcerated or something like you just can't have access or the, the caseworker for some reason decides it's just not right or safe right now to have access, get that. So every case is different, but our posture in our heart, even if there can be no interaction and no proximity at a minimum, and I, I don't mean to minimize this, but we can pray for them and we can yeah. pray for our heart towards them and pray right. for their healing and their restoration. And if we have kids in our home that are old enough to really understand what's going on, we can speak truth and life and dignity yeah. about them yes. to the kiddos yes. in our, in our home. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it's Michelle Obama that says it's hard to hate up close. And yeah, um, I, I love that so much, but, but realizing that vulnerable children often have struggling parents. Yes. And so there's a great opportunity to step in with love, not judgment, love that doesn't demonize or and that's open to redemption, frankly. That's right. So going back to that river, you know, the perception of foster care is often that there's really, really bad, evil people out there doing bad things to kids and they're throwing them in the water. And hmm. it, there are some cases where that's true. And those are the cases that typically make the news. Those are the ones where right. it's yeah. a kid was locked in a closet for years hmm. and you go, that's evil. And that evil needs to be rightfully dealt with. Yeah. Uh, now, the vast majority, however, are not that. The vast majority are, it's not bad people standing on the side of the river, throwing their kids in the water. The vast majority are, these are parents um, that were born in the water. All they've ever known is the water. They yeah. desperately want to break those cycles. They desperately yeah. want to get out. Now they're having kids in the water and they desperately want a better life for their kids. They want to break the cycles. They just don't know how, and they just don't have the support they need to do that. Um, and so what we find is these are, these are parents often, not in every case, but often who genuinely, absolutely love their kids, just like I love mine and want the best for their kids, just like I do mine. Uh, and the only difference, uh, and I know this is simplistic, but just the, this picture of really, when it comes down to it, the primary difference between maybe myself and, uh, a, a struggling, vulnerable parent that finds himself in the situation is, is the infrastructure of support underneath them. Yeah. So we've had moms live in our home that if they fall, they f fall far and don't stop falling yeah. kind of thing. What's an example of that? If their car breaks down and they don't have a couple hundred dollars to fix the car, then they can't get to work. They can't get to work. They lose their job. They lose their job. They can't pay rent, can't pay rent. Now they're home. Like you just keep falling. If our car breaks down, it's fixed within a few days, right? Like if we fall, we don't fall far. There's no scenario in which we're ever going to be homeless between family and friends. Like, so the, oftentimes the only difference is that infrastructure of support underneath. And for us to be willing to come alongside and underneath th these, these parents and these kiddos yeah. and say, um, from now on, uh, when you fall, because we're all going to fall. We're all going to fall at times, but our commitment to you is this. You will never, ever, ever fall alone again, and you will never, ever, ever fall as far again. Yeah. And sometimes that's the best that we can offer. That's all that we have to offer. It's so beautiful. I think that that's a, a, a great place to end. Um, hmm. Thank you so much. You know, um, you've given us a call to action, which is to find a family and, and support them. Um yeah. Is there anything else that we can be doing better? Because of course, I'm thinking as as you must be. Um, I'm thinking post row, you know, post row, um, mm -hmm. and and then the the overwhelm of a system that's um, already overwhelmed. Are, are there any other marching orders you have for us? Because we have a lot of really faithful um, listeners that are that are tender, that are tender to the spirit, and so I wonder if you yeah. could just speak to that. I would look at the fruit and the root of your fear and take an honest assessment mm -hmm. and perhaps do that in the context of safe, trusted community as yeah. well. Uh, my brain needs your brain to help my brain figure out what it's thinking and make sense of what it's sensing. And so to just sit down and say, what are those things that freeze us, that paralyze us? What are those fears that we have? What are the root of those fears, perhaps? Um, and how can we begin to do some work there? Um, and the answer is probably not going to be go from zero miles per hour to 100 miles per hour immediately. The answer will likely be, let's take, what's the next most simple step that we can take that increases proximity just a little bit. Yeah. I know we're running out of time. I, I often give this illustration in different contexts is I'm not a runner. I don't enjoy running for fun. Like I'll run for my life. I don't enjoy, I don't even like people that like running for fun. Like who, what's wrong with you? Like, what's wrong with you? especially where we live, <laughs> right? Because it's an oven. Uh, but, yeah. Or the surface um, of the sun. Yeah. And 
every once in a while, I have found myself saying, I'm, I feel like I need to go for a jog. And it's like, why? I don't know. Cause I'm like a dad, I'm a 40 year old dad. That feels like a good dad thing to do, to go for a jog. And I'm like, and so I'll think, well, in the neighborhood we used to live in, um, it was a, it was a mile and a half to the main entrance of the neighborhood from our front door. So three mile round trip for me, that's a marathon, three miles. I'd say, okay, I'm going to go run. I'm going to go run three miles. And then I would psych myself out and say, that this is going to be filled with agony and horribleness and I don't like it. I'm not going to do it. So then I learned how to trick myself. And I discovered that on the main road out of our neighborhood, there was a series of light posts about every 80 to hundred yards. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I figured out if I stopped focusing on the three mile marker and I just started paying attention to the light post, mm -hmm. it made the run a little more manageable. And so yeah. it became a series of 80 to hundred yard runs from light post to light post rather than a three mile run. And, and here's what it does for me. I think in that literal sense, but also just in life is it helps me see, okay, what's the next light post ahead of me. That's 80 to hundred. I can see it. It, it feels accomplishable. I can get there. And then when I get there, there's this built-in sense of accomplishment. Like, man, look, we've taken a big step, right? I didn't and then die. I, can, I didn't die. I made it. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a runner now, you know. And you're, and runners are like, no, you're not, dude. You just ran to a light post, you know. But and then at that light post, I can see the next one ahead, right? Like, okay, yeah. there it is, right? Um, and so our, 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 our encouragement, our challenge to to people is take an honest assessment of of those things that feel like keep you out or you're afraid of and, and, and do the work there and then look up and say, what's the next light post for us? Don't worry about the three mile marker. Uh, yeah. you'll eventually, you'll eventually find it. Uh, but what's the next light post? What's the next step we can take? And then when you do it, celebrate it. Like, yeah. man, this is, look what we've done as an individual or a couple or as a family or as a community, like, man, this is good. This feels good for us to take this step. Now let's, let's figure out what the next one is. That's right. it. There's um th this movie that I love. It's We Bought a Zoo. And Matt Damon is is talking <laughs> with his teenage son. And the teenage son, they they had been arguing throughout the whole movie. And they're finally having a come to Jesus where they're connecting again. Mm -hmm. And the teenage son confides in his dad. I think I like this girl. And mm -hmm. so he was seeking his dad's advice in his teenager, you know, disgruntled, angsty way. But his dad's advice was, it's 20 seconds of bravery, man. That's it. <laughs> That's it's it. just 20 seconds of bravery. And so when you can, I, I have made so many decisions that that my heart, that my spirit, mm. that I feel this holy nudge towards that feels scary. I've made so many decisions that way with that in the back of my mind. It's just 20 seconds of bravery or light post to light post, you know, what have you. Um, so, I just, yeah. I can't thank you enough, Jason. You are a passionate defender um, of families and children of human dignity. Um, you are all up and down that river. You are at the base of it. You're jumping in down here. And I just can't thank you enough. Um, how can we promote, promote, promote? I know that you have reframing foster care. I know that you have um, everybody can do something. Is that right? I usually have the copy, but I read yours on Kindle, so I don't. But um, I know that you have books. I know that you yeah. have very successful social media. Tell us all about it. If you just go to jasonjohnsonblog.com, mm -hmm. um, we tried to come up with the creative name years ago, and that's what we landed on. Simple, 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 simple. Uh, you'll find some books. Uh, if you are a leader in an organization or a church or in a community that really wants to be a convener and rally people in collaboration, you'll find some stuff there. If you're a family that's considering where, where, what it means for you to engage, uh, or you're a family that's deep in the trend, I say you're either a family that's that's looking to get your feet wet or you're a family yeah. that's not like knee deep or neck deep, like you're in over your head kind of thing, right? Like mm -hmm. you're either all in or you're considering getting in. So if you find yourself in either of those two places, there's a, a couple of books there for you just to encourage you. And again, the idea of reframing foster care, the title of one of the books is, um, what if my thoughts are not his thoughts? What if my perspective is bias to my own perspective like mate what if yeah. there's truth on the other side of my own truth or what my own thinking 
that if I could just have a helpful tool that helps me see things that I am incapable of seeing on my own, that would really breathe life into this part of the journey that I'm on. That's all that these things are intended to do. So you can find everything there. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you'll come back. I know we have so much more to talk about. I really appreciate you. We could talk for hours. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) You bet. Friends, you might not know this, but I wrote a book. It's a spiritual memoir of sorts and puts a modern day spin on old parables that are still so applicable to our everyday lives. Judgment, forgiveness, evangelizing, heartbreak, joy. I'd love for you to grab a copy. Head on over to Amazon and look for Rock, Paper, Scissors by Allison Sullivan. Hello, Beefy. Hi, Beefy, Beef, Beef. So we have needed to do this episode forever, and I knew just who I wanted to come onto the show to do the episode, but it never occurred to me that Jason Johnson would have a big enough hole in his schedule to be able to say yes, but he did. And I was so excited. I loved having him. It was an awesome conversation. I so, so, so wished you were the one hosting the episode. You would have added so much. You would have contributed so much. It would have been super awesome. But um, what would you think? I totally disagree. I already got to listen to it, and um, he's awesome. Awesome. He's somebody that I followed and somebody that I've read for a long time. Um, definitely a couple of years into our foster journey. Cause I remember just feeling like so validated by his words. Um, but if you're the whole reason why we are foster parents. And so I think that it definitely makes all the sense in the world that you lead the interview um, and lead all of this. I can remember distinctly, we've talked about this in other seasons. I was meeting with our agency about something completely unrelated to Mike and I ever becoming foster parents. And I was so touched by their mission. And I got in the car as babies do. And I called you to tell you about it. And I was sobbing. Mm -hmm. And you said, beef, you're going to end up taking, like, you're going to end up doing this. And uh, I I remember like my heart dropped or my stomach dropping because it was so wild. But when you say things like that, you're always right. And I was like scared to death and excited all at the same time. Uh, I love it so much. (laughs) It's really, it's emotional for me to go back to that time because we walked it so closely together. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there was, I, I love Jason's approach because there is a part of this that feels so urgent and yet he approaches it cautiously and patiently, you know, as someone who has all the information and who knows as much as he does, he understands that that's not where we're all coming from. There's this judge and she just, I don't know, she just advocates for compassionate justice. Her name is Martinez Jones. And she, I was reading something and she had this quote that said, childhood is so short We have children for such a short amount of time, and during that time, they're remarkably impressed upon and transformed into the the adults that they're going to become. And so basically what her point was is that if we can do better by children, then we're doing better by them as adults, and then we're changing society. And the magnitude of that, like when I hear that and when I hear all the stats, you know, I'm like, what are we doing? You know, it's like there's this panic, and then Jason's like – Let's let's just pray about fear. Let's right. just take a meal to someone, you know. Um, as you were listening, well, any, first of all, do you have any thoughts on that? And then, secondly, do you did you want to expand on any like list he gave of first mm-hmm. steps? I know that you've been so taken care of by your community. What are some things that have meant a lot to you? Yeah. So I just love the way he talked about the river. That analogy and that visual is so good, and about how we can all get in and be at different places and serve in different spots. Um, and they're all important, um, but it, but he he gives such a comprehensive, um, deeper view of of foster care um, and the ecosystem, as he kept calling it. Um, the thing that we uh, love, the way we love to be supported, I guess, is um, childcare. You know, mm-hmm. I talk about this all the time. I joke that you have to have a PhD to babysit our kids, and um, it's it's just shy of that. It feels like it is. It is um, interviews, it is background checks, it is going to an FBI office to get your fingerprint, it is an extensive CPR and first aid class, it's reoccurring um, uh, classes that you have to take online and in person. It is such a, I feel like it's such a burden and it's really hard for me to ask for that. I've I've gotten a little bit better over the last um, six and a half years, but um, 
but it's, it's something that I'm quick to tell people like, Oh no, gosh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to do better about not doing that and just saying, yes, thank you. Here's Please. these yeah. 17 items that you have to do mm-hmm. to babysit my kids. Mm-hmm. But when somebody's willing to do that, it's just such a blessing to be able to obviously just, it's just, it's what you need to do to go to the grocery store and go to target. It's what you need to do to have a date. Um, it's what you need to do to, we foster babies. And so it's what we need to do to be able to do a big kid activity with our big kids. It's just sure. a, a huge, let alone like get away for a weekend right, or right, anything right. like that. Yeah. Um, you know, this was on my list of things to ask him that we didn't necessarily get to. And I think it was probably better suited for you anyway. But we sit around our table at night as a family and we go through our day, we reflect and we call it the happiest and crappiest. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I not know that? <laughs> What? You don't know that? Um, your kids do. Your kids. <laughs> um, do you have beef any that you're willing to share at least? Um, a happiest and crappiest. And I don't I don't mean to poke fun because this is a uh, yeah. very serious topic. But um, do you have a happiest and crappiest of your journey? So our journey so far has been about six and a half years. Five kids, five foster kids, um, three girls and two boys. Um, there have been a ton of happies and there's been a ton of crappies. Um, but the first that comes to my mind, it's easier to start with crappy is, um, Alex. He came to us at eight months old. He, he followed, a, we had a, a newborn that left on a Tuesday and Alex came to us on a Wednesday and he was chunky and smiley and eight months old. And we were so excited that we were going to get to sleep, right? Cause it was an, an older child, um, And he did not sleep and he did not have a lot of quiet and um, peaceful moments at all for the two years that we had him. Um, He was just frustrated all the time. He had experienced a ton of trauma in just eight months. He taught us about that. We didn't know that they could go through so much in such a, uh, at such a young age. And so he couldn't communicate. He he had delays um, that made him really, really frustrated. Um, We had him during COVID. We had him when another foster kiddo came back unexpectedly his case was just so complicated too. Um, as a lawyer, I get to get to know things uniquely as a foster parent about why the system should work. And it just failed him over and over and over. And it was so frustrating because I felt like as a professional, I, I knew how to help him, but as his mom, I couldn't, um, it was so hard. And then, and then I'm going to be really vulnerable and tell you that there came a moment where we are tell you tell everybody <laughs> that there came a moment where we were, we had the opportunity to um, adopt him and we didn't feel called to that. And that was super awkward and hard and a really weird, unique feeling to wrestle with. Um, and so just everything about Alex's placement was hard and complicated and challenged us and stretched us. Um, so, so he was not crappy parts of, of his <laughs> placement were really crappy. Um, but, but that makes him the biggest high too, because, um, because someone in our agency gave us the advice of it's okay to not feel called to adopt. It's okay to feel called to be a gap filler for kids. And, um, and we prayed and prayed and prayed for his forever home when it became clear that that wasn't going to be his biological parents. And he was matched with the most perfect parents for him that allowed us to stay in his life and, and have told us and promised us. And we're certain that we will get to stay in his life. Um, and so like the concrete high is that a couple of weeks ago, she sent me a video of him. Um, and she said, Alex, what's your name? And he said, my name is Alex. And he practiced his new his what will be his adopted last name. Um, <laughs> and just that moment was like such a, such a full circle. Like we have and he's, he's, he's so, um, he's, he's kind of made it across, I think of a developmental hump. He's just, Mm. he's in a better spot and he can communicate now and he's happier now. And, um, it's just, um, it's such a blessing to have been through that story, but you know, there were many, many days of that story where we just thought, God has made a mistake here. Like, yeah. like we're supposed to be equipped for what we're called for. And we didn't feel yeah. equipped so many days. Um, and we're on the other side of that. And I'm so, so grateful for that experience. Um, and I will obviously remember it when we're probably in a similar experience with another kiddo in the future. Yeah. I'm overwhelmed with how difficult that his case was and that that's the, that both of your answers 
because I know the rest of your other kids' stories and how magical they are as well and how heartbreaking they have been as well. And so that he encapsulates both of those is so so awesome to me. Mm -hmm. Um, You're obviously very gifted at this beefy. And uh, you accompany families so well. I, it's a marvel to me um, how you really do take in the whole child's ecosystem with <laughs> such, not necessarily ease, um, but nice. with a lot of competence and skill. Thank you. Thank you. I remember you saying like early on in the journey, you, I remember you first saying, which has not come true yet, that you knew there would be a day where I would like forget to tell you when we had like a new placement because this would just all become like so like normal. That hasn't happened totally yet, but we're definitely, <laughs> Like, I would be so sad. I cannot no, imagine I would, saying I that. <laughs> um, but it's obviously like a very different situation when somebody new comes into our house than it was at the beginning. Um, but the other thing I remember you saying is that you were anticipating that I was going to love the family well, which was really nice and beefy of you to expect that. But I remember thinking, well, we're, we're going to take care of little babies. Like it, <laughs> it hadn't occurred to me yet that there would be this ecosystem, as Jason said, um, but we have definitely um, Mm -hmm. been brought into ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And that's been for me, like the most surprising part of it so far is just um, the the things that we've been exposed to. Um, Mike and I were just talking after listening to Jason's interview about you know, we've never been closer to mental illness. We've never been closer to addiction. We've never been closer to poverty, poverty. We've never been more just humbled by our, our privilege and our lack of, um, of, of just understanding of so many people. And, and it's a blessing to get to know people like how Jason said, like up close, right. So that you don't, mm-hmm. you don't have space to mm-hmm. fill it with the things that you think you knew, knew, or, or, or yeah. um, and so anyway, that's, that's just continues to surprise us, um, all the time is just how, um, how much bigger foster care has been for us than just the kiddo that's in our house. Yeah. Thank you for your example, Beefy. You care for the least of these so, so well. Love you so much. Thank you, Thank you for supporting us with every one of them. Thank you so, so much for listening. Thank you for being here. A very special thank you to all guests and sponsors. A really special thank you to Taylor Schroll for mixing and editing. For more content, you can head over to Instagram at Allison M. Sully and TikTok at Sullivan Family TikTok. You can also check out Forte Catholic and subscribe there where you have a 25% chance of hearing me co-host. I am so grateful for all of the love and support that we offer each other here. Today's show was a production of Allison Sullivan in conjunction with the Forte Catholic Podcast Network. For more great Catholic podcasts, head on over to ForteCatholic.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.